So we're in this series now. It's the conclusion. It's, it's part five in this five-week uh, series that we've called As Long As We Both Shall Live. I've really loved teaching this series. And, um, and I know that God has been touching marriages and really restoring marriages in this season as well. In this series, the big question that we've been asking is, are great marriages even possible? Like, is that, is it, can we, can we even get there anymore? And understand that, that a lot of us, we approach this idea of marriage, or at least God's version of it, with kind of a little cynical sometimes, because we've seen the failures and the hurts. And, and I understand that. I get that. I saw a Facebook post, post of one guy a while back, and he was, he was just giving up on relationships. He said, I'm done. I'm, I'm done. I give up on, 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 on relationships. It's just me and my dog. It was a picture of him and his dog. He said, it's just me and my dog from here on out. By the way, I, could, I can probably prove to you that, um, and I read this. I wanna, so one guy said, I can prove to you that your dog loves you more than your spouse. He said, you're just better off, better off with a dog than with a spouse. I can prove it to you. He said, here's how I can prove it to you. Put, lock, your, lock your dog and your spouse in the trunk of your car. Leave for an hour, come back, let them out, and see which one's happy to see. <laughs> right? Right? Don't go trying that now. That's not a fill-in. That's not a fill-in. Do not, don't, don't do it, okay? Um, I realize, I realize that we can approach this topic with a little bit of cynicism because most of us have had failed relationships, most of us, in our dating years, possibly. Or maybe you are here today and you are maybe coming out of what you would consider a failed uh, relationship. Um, and I get it. But what I want to submit to you today is that, that great relationships are possible if you do them God's way. And, and, and that, that the world has a way of doing relationships. And if you do it the world's way, you're going to get the world's results. And there's no way around that. And the world's results statistically is a 50-50% success rate. That's, that's just the success rate of, of, of marriages surviving. But God has something for you so much better in your marriage. We've got to start turning to God's way and God's word. Let's check out what his word says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 one more time. This has been our theme verse. This picture of love, it's really a picture of God's love that he makes available to us, for us, and through us. He says, love never gives up never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Do you guys know, the Bible says that God is love. How I many you know that? That God is love. He is. Like, God loves you with an unending, unending undying, un, unfading love. Let me read this to you with that, with that mindset, that God is love. Look at this. God never gives up. God never loses faith. God is always hopeful, and God endures through every circumstance. That's his love he has for you. Can I just encourage you with this thought today? That no matter what you've done, no matter how far you've gone, you're not too far away from God's love. It endures forever. His, his, his love endures forever. It, it, through every circumstance, through every trial, through every challenge, God loves you and he offers you today. Maybe you're here today and you're a little bit cynical about relationships, maybe even cynical about God. But he offers you today what he offers everybody else in this room, and that's a fresh start. That is a do-over. God wants to give you a fresh start. So in order, to, in order to have this kind of relationship, the as long as we both shall live, God-like relationship, to have it according to God and not according to the world's ways, we said that we have to commit. We have to make and commit to five different commitments. This has been the study. I've given them to you every week. I'm hoping they're drilled in because we're really changing and transforming the way we do marriage. Amen? Amen, church? Okay, here they are. Number one is what we said we need to do. It needs to start here. We've got to seek God. We are going to seek God. We're going to make a decision to do this. And maybe God wasn't involved in your relationship in the past, or, or maybe, maybe he wasn't. Or, but we're going to make a commitment to seek God together. I'm going to seek the one with my two. And I'm not going to expect my spouse to give me something that only God was intended to give. We're going to seek God together. Here's the second commitment was fight fair. Fight fair. So we're going to fight. That's okay. It's okay to have some fights. But uh, you're not supposed to fight to win, okay? You're supposed to fight to, you know, for your marriage. You're supposed to fight to make it work and fight to, to stay together. Here's the third commitment. Have fun. And, and that means, you know, having fun socially, having fun emotionally, like get into the world of your spouse and start doing things that they enjoy. And so many marriages have lost the fun. They've lost the enjoyment of it. And they, and, and they wonder like, oh man, I just, you know, 
Where's the fire and the passion? Well, you need to throw a log back onto that fire is what it is. You got to invest into it. So we talked about that. We even talked about the romantic, physical side of having fun in marriage. And, and, and some say, well, is God okay with that? Yeah, God's okay with that. He created it, man. And he's got a lot to say about it, actually. You can watch that message online. Any of these messages are archived. Check them out online. Here's the one we, we studied last week. And that was the commitment to stay pure. To stay pure. And I am convinced, you guys, that this one right here is the culprit for why marriages are so unsuccessful today. I really believe that. I really believe that we we have allowed too much of the world to influence us. We've allowed our lives to be polluted. The things that we're allowing to influence our lives and our minds in the purity that we're supposed to have in our marriage and in our families, that that it's being influenced by the wrong things. So we said we got to commit to stay pure pure. And then today we're going to end with this final commitment. And that is to never give up. I'm going to never give up. Now, why in the world do we need to even have this kind of commitment? Because there's going to come a time where you're going to want to give up. That's why every relationship has it. Every marriage, you're going to come to a place where you're like, I didn't sign up for this, man. I know I ain't taking that no more. I'm out of here. You know, there's going to come a part where you just want to say enough is enough. I'm done with all that noise. I'm out of here. And more and more people are, are giving their, their, they're making an option out of divorce. The divorce is an option. More and more people divorce is an option for their relationship. In fact, most people um, don't even like the word never because it's too committed. It's like, no, no, don't say never. It's like this. I don't know if I don't, don't it never say never, you know, kind of thing. And it's a bugaboo word because, I mean, I'll say it in my wedding vows. I mean, I say it in my wedding vows because I want my wedding to be poetic. I want it to be nice and pretty. So I'll say, I'll make, a, I'll make it in my wedding vows. I'll say it to, before God. I'll say it before a pastor, before all these witnesses and friends and family and stuff. Um, I'll say that there's only one thing that will cause us to separate, honey, as long as we both shall live till death. Do us part. Only death is going to separate our love from each other. And 99% of you married people that are in this room, you said something of that effect. We, we made that, that vow to have and to hold as long as you both shall live. Yeah. Um, Ruth Graham, Billy Graham's wife, she was asked recently, which we lost a saint of God in just recently. We really did with Billy Graham. But his wife was asked um, if she, you know, was ever got ever got mad at Billy Graham? I mean, this is Billy Graham, man. This is, this is a man of God. Did you ever get mad? Like, what's your marriage look like? And she said, absolutely, I got mad at him. I mean, he was gone all the time. He was traveling. He was in crusades. And, 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 and it was, of course, I was, I was mad at him at times. And, and, and the follow-up question to that was, well, did you ever consider or even think about leaving him? Was that ever, was that? And she said, absolutely not. Divorce? No. Murder? Yes. <laughs> so... <laughs> till death do us part. So we're going to extend this message series one more week. We're going to have a sixth commitment. Don't kill each other. That's just, <laughs> just got to put that out there in case some of you are. But we all have conflict in our marriages. We, we, we do because w- most of us married our opposites. They say that opposites attract in marriage. And, and, and they say about 90% of us who are married picked someone who was not like us. That, that were like, you know, opposites in a lot of areas. They just had those kind of differences. And, and they say that opposites attract, right? They do because at first it's like, oh, they complete me, right? I just don't think that way. And they think that way. Oh, how good. How cool is that? They don't think like I think. And that would be something good. Oh, and I like this and they like that. And we just complete each other. I, I mean, you know, opposites attract when you're dating and opposites attack when you're married. <laughs> That's what happens. You was cute. It used to be cute, but it ain't no cute no more. It's cute on my nerves, man. How come? What's the matter with you? You don't see this the way that I see it, honey. I don't, I don't get it. And most of us did. Most of us married our opposites, and I'll prove it to you. You guys, play, play along with me here. How many of you in your relationship, like, like you are the punctual one. You're the on-time one. You like being on time, maybe even early. Come on, come on. Where are you at? Where are you at? Yeah, hands go up. You're like, that's me. Yep. Yep, yep. And how many, how many of you, the others though, the other side of the spectrum, how many kind of just go with the flow, you're just kind of more creative type, come on. Some of you are like, mm, I'll raise my hand when I get around to it. <laughs> right? How many of you, how many are here and you are like, you're the planners. When you go on a trip, you like to plan it out. You're all about the destination. You like to plan it. Who are my planners? Planners, 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 planners. Okay, fantastic. 
How many of you, you are not a, like the desk. You're all about the journey. You got to stop and see every tree, every tree. Come on. You need deliverance. You need deliverance. All right. How many of you like, how about money? Money matters here. How many of you are the, 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 the savers in the relationship? You like to save money, save, 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 savers, savers. Yep. And then how many of you are the spenders in the relationship? Come on, spenders, right? Okay, ushers, keep your hands up. Ushers, that's where they're at. Like, through the buckets, the buckets right there. That's where, stop it, right there. <laughs> We're just different, okay? But when our differences get highlighted, I mean, it used, to, it used to be cute when we were dating, but now it irritates us. So what do we do? What do we do with that? Well, you have to have a value. You have to have, you have, to have a, a different value because, because every one of you are, let's face it, you guys, you're going to come to a point where you want to throw in the towel, where you want to give up, where you want to just say, I don't, I don't think so. But Jesus had a very different mindset than the world has about marriage. And we listen, we have to get away <clears throat> from treating marriage or treating relationships, in fact, like they're disposable. So many of us, we cut, we, that's the way we think of relationships. Like we so easily cut people out of the equation, dispose and discard them. And we just got to get back to the word of God. What does God's word say? Let's look at it in Matthew chapter 19. It says some Pharisees came to Jesus to test him. And it says that, that uh, and you'll, you'll find out why in a moment. He says, they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Which they could in those days. They could do that. They had what called, what's called a no-fault divorce, right? And America has that. America has a no-fault divorce laws, which are fairly new. You used to not be able to do that. You used to not, you used to not be, you, used to have, you have to have grounds for divorce. This is a fairly new law, at least in our, in our society, in our culture. He says, can, can, can anyone divorce his wife for any and every reason? So, in fact, you know, in those culture, in this culture, the wives were not even, they were considered property. It wasn't even up to the woman. It was up to the man. If the, if the marriage was going to continue, the man had the option to either continue it or end it. In fact, in that time, and actually in some cultures still today, uh, the, the man will hold the license of the marriage in his breast pocket just in case she starts getting out of line. I'm serious. You think I'm joking? Like he's, he's just right underneath the jacket. And she starts, you know, what would you say? Ah, ah, and it just stick, and they would just stick it out because at any time you can just take that thing out and, and tear it, and, and the marriage is over. Ah, ah, bah, bah, oh, mm, mm. Yeah, it's, it's, some of you guys are thinking that sounds like a great place to visit. That's not that's not good. But but these guys are testing Jesus because Jesus is talking about this unconditional love and surrender and sacrifice and and, and turn the other cheek and all these things. He's like they're like, well, let's test this one out, okay? And so Jesus responds, well, haven't you read? That at the beginning, the creator made them male and female female, and said, and this is the Garden of Eden account now, and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united. And when he says united, he's not talking about the contract that they would sign. He's talking about the supernatural union, the spiritual supernatural bond that takes place under a marriage covenant. He says they'll be united. He'll be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. He says, there's this bond that takes place in this union. It would be similar to you taking two pieces of school paper, you know, the, like the blue line paper, put some, you put glue on one of the papers and you match up the line just perfectly and put them and you, you leave that there for a month. You come back to that thing and you try to un one what has already been made one. And you're going to find out there's going to be a lot of tears and rips damage it's, it's not pretty when you try to unone what's been made one. And this is what Jesus was literally saying. He's giving them that picture and he's saying, no, it can't be for any and every reason. And it's not because, by the way, it's not just like a rule. He's not like, because I said so. That's the rule. You just got to, you got to do it. No, God's like, Jesus is saying, you don't understand. It's just not that easy for any and every reason. No, you can't do it. It's not that easy. You cannot unone What's been made one. There's going to be damage. Tears. It's going to be ugly. And some of you have experienced that. Some of you have experienced that pain. That ripping. That happens. Some of you have experienced it maybe firsthand or secondhand. And can I just tell you. If that's you. My heart goes out to you today. And I want you to know. That there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. That God loves you. With an unending. Undying love. That. That. 
His love never gives up and endures through every circumstance. It is new every morning. God loves you. And he is offering you today the same offer he has for every single one of us. And that's a fresh start. That is a do over. And God doesn't get scrambled eggs and puts them back to, you know, back in it. No, no, no. God, God give, makes you brand new. That's, that's what he offers us today. And I'm also not saying that if you're in a relationship that's abusive, like never give up. Don't never give up on that thing. Just continue to be a doormat and a punching bag and don't ever give up. That's not what I'm saying at all. Please hear me out. Because uh, oftentimes in abusive relationships, we encourage separation to happen so that God can bring healing to that relationship. But Jesus is just saying, he's, he's telling them, for any and every, come on, God, it's not that easy. Do you think it's that easy to unwind what God has made supernaturally one, it's not that easy. So he says, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, and you hear this in weddings often, let no one separate. Don't just think, he says, don't just think you can unwind so easily what's been made one supernaturally. Don't think that you can unwind so easy what God has made one supernaturally. Be careful. So what was he saying? He's saying, you have to understand the seriousness of this relationship. The oneness that that is there and the one that that bond that's there. It wasn't God didn't put it there to keep you from separating like just that. Oh, no, no, he put he is, his he always intended for there to be this supernatural bond that would take place. That there would be such a solid unity and relationship between a man and a wife in marriage. That was his idea. That was God's idea. So what do we do about it? We need to understand God's way. We need and we need to make a fresh commitment from this disposable uh different kind of mindset that the world has with marriage and it's not that easy and it's not that clean we have to realize today that if you want to have god's way in your relationships write this down if you're taking notes that marriage is a covenant not a contract marriage is a covenant not a contract and i'll explain the difference i mean a contract works well when you're when you're you know buying a house it works well when you're getting, you know, the more. Have anyone bought a house recently? The stacks of papers that you have to sign. It's like if you do, like you got to do this and then do this and then, but you got to do that and that. And then if you don't do this, then I'm not going to do this. And there's just all this protecting our rights and protecting my property and protecting my. We're going to defend our property and defend our rights. And we got this. We go into it with a contractual mindset when you buy a house. And we go into marriage with that same contractual mindset. I believe that that same mindset, that contractual mindset, has seeped into marriages in a lot of way. A lot of people, they brought that same mind. And and because of that, marriages are more disposable than than ever. What does a covenant mean? The Hebrew word for covenant literally means, for those extra note takers, it literally, literally means to cut. That's what that means. A covenant was to cut because in those times when a covenant was established, there was shed blood. There was a cutting that took place. In fact, in, in, in biblical times, what they would do, the priest or rabbi would make a small incision on the, on the groom and the bride on their palms. And he would, he would make a small incision and he would put their hands together at the altar there before the, the, the friends and family. And he would take his rope or his cord or his cloth, whatever it was, and he would tie them together. And he was, what he was saying with it, that this is not a casual, disposable, this is a covenant. This is a blood pact that is being made. In, in, in biblical times, they would also, what they would do is they'd sacrifice a bull when someone would get married. And, and the priest, what he would do is chop up that bull and he put it at the altar. How many sound romantic right now? You, no? I mean, glad we don't do that now in weddings. We're not, we don't do that at Discovery. But... It was, it was a symbolism that it would be there at the altar and the, and the groom would take his bride and he would walk around the pieces, walk through them. And, and, and through the blood, through the sacrifice, through the blood and the sacrifice of the bull. And they would say, hey, be it unto, be it unto us as unto this bull if we break from our vows that we have made today. And I know it's, it's like gruesome and stuff, but there is a beautiful symbolism here. It's why Jesus, Jesus said in Luke chapter 22, um, this is where he establishes his covenant. And covenant is always, was always a blood pact. Uh, I love this scripture in Luke chapter 22. This is in the upper room. This is the Lord's Supper. This is actually Thursday. This is the Thursday night before Jesus went to the cross. And I love that we're talking about covenant today. And I'm going to show you the scripture where Jesus instituted 
his covenant relationship was actually on a Thursday because next Sunday we're talking about Friday. And then we're going to talk about Saturday and we're going to talk about Sunday. So this is Thursday. This is Thursday right here. He says in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. He said, I'm getting ready to show you how much I love you. I'm getting ready to show you the permanency of my commitment to you. I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to die. I'm going to bleed. And this is the ultimate covenant relationship. A covenant relationship is a permanent relationship. A covenant relationship is an unconditional relationship. In fact, I define marriage. My personal definition of marriage is an unconditional commitment to an imperfect person. It's an unconditional commitment. To an imperfect person. See, I know that you're imperfect. I know that you're going to do things that I don't like. I know that, that you know, you're going to mess up. I know we're going to have days where we don't get along. But on that day, my wife knows. She has the safety and the security to know that even though we're mad, we don't agree or whatever it is at the end of it, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. Because we have taken divorce off the table. This is an unconditional covenant that I have made. And I'm telling you, when you bring covenant into your relationships, it brings the power of God. And so many relationships are lacking divine, supernatural power because it's not established by covenant. Let me tell you something about the covenant that God has made with you. It's so beautiful because God did not wait to see how you would respond to his offer. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us like he established this covenant relationship, knowing that some of us would not take him up on the offer that while he was being nailed uh, to the cross, he was dying, forgiving and making provision for the very person nailing him to the cross. That is love. And that is honestly the power of the cross. When you accept Jesus into your life, when you receive this incredible offer, because every one of us have given God reason to bail on us, haven't we? Every one of us have given God reason to say, you know what, I'm tired of it. I'm done with you. I've given you enough chances. When are you going to get it? But his mercy endures forever. And when we receive that, when we receive that unconditional love and that covenant relationship, it empowers me to give it to others as well. That's the power of the cross. When you're on the receiving end of the love of God, when you're on the receiving end of the covenant of God, it gives me the capacity to do the same now. First John actually says that we love because God first loved us. You see, I didn't have, I can't do this. I can't love like this. There's no way that it's beyond my capacity to love like God loves, to have the kind of marriage in the purpose and design that God established it. There is no way. The only way is I can only love because I've received his love first. I can only make this covenant with my wife because I have a covenant with my God. Can I get an amen, somebody? So let me show you the differences between covenant and contract. Let me show you the difference between God's way in relationships and the world's way. Covenant and contract. Write these down. Covenant is based on mutual commitment. Covenant is based on mutual commitment. A lot of people like to talk commitment. But listen, it's not commitment if you draw a line in the sand. It's not commitment if you go, hey, I'm in this as long as as long as you do your part. As long as it's going great, but if if you don't, if you start and if you do this, then I'm not in this anymore. Then you're not committed. That's not, that is not commitment means being willing to be unhappy for a while while we work it out. Let me tell you that again. Okay. Commitment means being willing to be unhappy while we work it out. You see, you don't need, you don't need commitment in the good times. You only need commitment when it's bad. That's when commitment needs to show up at that very moment when they're not meeting your expectations, when when you're mad or upset or there's difficulty. That's where commitment shows up. Covenant is based on a mutual commitment. A contract is based on mutual distrust. And that's why we have all these pages, lots and lots of pages when we're doing mortgages and getting loans and stuff like that because we're protecting stuff and... uh, 
and, and, and some people put that into their marriages now and we get these, we get these prenups. You know, got to get a prenup going on here because, because I got to protect my stuff. Because if you, if you, if it's anytime you are acting like, like a fool and then I'm not, you ain't getting my stuff. I got to protect my stuff. Okay. Like, in fact, I read recently there was this wedding where a couple rewrote their vows, you know, where it's like, you know, I will love and cherish and honor and, 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 and respect and, 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 you know, sickness and in health, as long as we both shall live. They rewrote it and they said, they said this, they said, I promise to be faithful to you as long as I shall love you. <laughs> I said, okay, we'll give it a couple weeks, man. That's it. <laughs> I mean, how many married people know what I'm talking about? By show of applause. How many married people know that marriage takes work? It takes commitment. Come on, by show of applause. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in fact, you guys know what honeymoon means? Like the, the literal, like honeymoon. You know what that means? It means sweet month. Right? Because after that, no, I'm kidding. All right. All right, look at the next definition. Covenant surrenders rights and assumes responsibility. Covenant surrenders rights and assumes responsibility responsibility and this one flies in the face of our entitlement mentality that honestly every single one of us has a little bit of because of the world we live in and the culture that we live in because i deserve to be happy really like think think about it. i deserve to be treated better than this and and i'm not and i'm, I'm just afraid we've we've let the entitlement culture influence us too much but covenant says i give up my life to you i surrender my rights. I give it up for you. The, Jesus says, the Bible says that, that the husband is to love his wife like Christ loved the church. Who gave up his life for the church. Like, wow. Like, covenant says, I surrender. It doesn't say, what am I getting? It surrenders rights and assumes responsibility. Contract protects rights and shirks responsibilities. So, it's, it's protect. No, I gotta, I gotta protect myself here. I'm gonna, I, I need to make sure, like, and, and uh, if you only if you do that, then I'll then I'll do this. I mean, I'll take a step if you're going to take a step forward, and and I'll come and I'll do my part if you do. Part. But if I see you taking a step back, and if I see you not doing your part, not being responsible to what you said, well, I'm not going to be responsible. Why am I going to? Why am I going to continue if you're not going to continue? Okay, fine, fine. And and so you take steps back, and they take steps back. That's a contractual relationship. That is not a covenant, unconditional relationship that God designed in marriages. But so many of us live that way, tit for tat. You do this and I'll do that. But if you don't do this and all the contract protects rights and shirks responsibilities. Let's look at one more definition. Covenant has the interests of the other in mind. So really, I'm not even in this for what I can give my wife or what my wife can give me. That's not why I'm in this. I'm in this for what I can give her. That's that's the covenant. It's not about what what I can get out of it. It's about what I can give her. That's covenant. And, and it's so beautiful because when both have that mindset, it's reciprocal and needs are met in a covenant marriage and a covenant relationship. Contract has personal convenience in mind. Okay. Cause I'll, I'll stay with it as long as it's still good for me, as long as, you know, but when it stops being for good for me, I'm out of here when you stop or when this happens. So what is God's word calling us back to God's word is calling us back to this blood relationship to this, to the, a covenant Pack a covenant relationship. I saw the power of this years ago when I was counseling a couple. Years ago when I was doing a counseling with a couple. I don't do very much counseling anymore because I suck at it. Just to be honest with you guys. Because I found, like as I'm doing counseling with couples, I, I, can, I can usually, um, one of the things God has given me the ability to, to, to problem solve. So I can see solutions. I can see what we need to So 10 minutes into it, I'm like, I got this. I know what we need to do. <laughs> You need to do this, you need to do that. And so, but what I found in counseling, they don't want to know the answers so much as just talk to you. And I don't got the patience for that, okay? Um, so we've got some more counselors, some pastors that have a lot more patience than me to help me out. And I, and, and, and I do what I'm strong at here at Discovery, praise the Lord. And, and that's just not one of them. But when I was, I was doing some counseling years ago, man. I was doing some counseling. I was walking with this couple. It was about four months into this thing, man. And, and what, what happened was the husband was unfaithful. He committed adultery. And for four months, walking with him through this, and it was four months into it that she came to, they both came and, you know, to, the, to the session, and she says, you know what, it ain't going to work. I just, I just can't do it. It's not going to work. And, and I was very caring and pastoral with them. In these situations, I want you to know, my 
what I told her was, was, I know you got biblical grounds, like you have the right to leave. You got the right to, to divorce, but can I just encourage you to pray and ask God for direction? Because it may be more painful to do that. It may be more painful for you, for your future, for your kids. It just may be more painful. Why don't you, will you pray and, and, and ask God? And honestly, as you, just so you guys know my heart, in those situations, as a pastor, what I want is to make sure that I pastor them through it. Like, no matter what the choice is, like, they, it, whatever choice they, they make, like, I want to make sure that God's on the other end with them. And they, they're going to walk through them because God's mercy endures forever. And so that's what I'm telling them. I say, you know what? In, the, in, in any case, regardless, I'm with you. And we're going to see, see you through this. And we're going to get on the other side and be healed. And God's going God's to do a great work in your lives. And I'm going to help you out. And so anyway, she, they come back a week later. She actually came back by herself. She said, just want to let you know, Pastor, it's done. I filed. It's, I just thank you so much. You were so gracious, but I just, I just want you to know, like, I just, I, I can't do it, but thank you. I appreciate it. I said, you know, I'm going to continue to pray for you guys. And, and now more than ever, you need to seek God. Like this ain't the time to now disconnect or stop. Like this is the time to press in and make sure that God is your one. Okay. And so I just minister for a little bit. Okay. And I'm walking her out of the office there at the church. And as we're walking out, she turns to me and says, Oh, pastor, by the way, do we have any addiction, like drug addiction, like recovery type ministries here? And I said, yeah, we do. We actually had to celebrate recovery at that church, and we had a we we have one here at this church. And I just begin, yeah, we got celebrate recovery. Told her about celebrate recovery, and I said, why? Why do you ask? And she says, well, I got this brother who's just been strung out his whole adult life. I basically support him. I support him, and 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 he's burned me so many times. I've I, I've given him thousands of dollars. I bailed him out of jail twice. Um, he just is messed up, but, but I believe pastor, if we just get him some help, we can help him. And I was just like, whoa, 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 time out, time out. Can, can, can you just, I'm curious to know and understand why is it with this relationship with your brother who, who, who has messed you over many times, you've given thousand dollars to you, you bailed him out. Why is it you can be so understanding or, or just patient and, and, and continue with, with, with this relationship, but. But this relationship with your husband is just a little bit more disposable. Why is it? And she goes, she goes, I'll never forget it. She, Pastor, well, he's my blood brother. And it dawned on me, it just, okay, there is the problem right there. Could it be that the reason why your marriage covenant relationship is so easily disposable and discarded is because you don't have the right definition of what that is? Could it be that you're not seeing it like God sees that pact of blood that you have made? Because if any one of your kids, if my kid were to fall off the deep end and just, I would chase them to the ends of the world because they're my kids. They're my blood. God sees your covenant relationship with your spouse the same way. It is a blood pact. Could it be that we're just, the reason why they're so easily discarded and disposable is because we don't have the right definition. We're not seeing them the way that God sees them, which is why in Malachi chapter 2, God says this. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. Why? Because that's the rule. That's why. No, that's not why. Watch this. The man who hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord, the God of Israel, does violence to the one He was supposed to protect. God is saying in that moment when they were strung out and they were on drugs and they weren't their best, they were actually at their worst. That's why I gave him you. That's why I gave her you in that moment of their weakest, darkest hour. That's where your covenant was supposed to come in and protect that person. But you hated them. You did violence to the one you made a pact to protect. God says, man, don't, don't be unfaithful. That's why I gave you to each other. So your covenant could show up in the darkest time and love them unconditionally. Years ago, one of my kids made a big mistake. It's too close to it. So I won't tell you too much or which kid, but they made a mistake and it it kind of broke mom and dad's heart. And we could have came into that situation like angry, upset. And said, How, I can't believe you. You know better. And, and really just came in like that. But I really felt in that moment that this was a defining moment for my kid. And that I need to have the right heart going into it. And when I went into that conversation, I did, not, I did not respond to that challenge the way that they thought I would. And I reaffirmed my care and my love and their calling. 
and how God sees them and how I see them. And can I tell you that at that moment, I have never loved my child more than in that precise moment of need. Listen, love does not give a person what they deserve. Love gives a person what they need. Love does not give a person what they deserve. Love gives a person what they need. So the next verse says, so be on your guard. Why? Because you're going to feel like bailing. You're going to feel like cutting loose. And do not be unfaithful. So what do we do? Let me give you three things. Three things that I'm convinced. If you, if you bring these values back into your relationship. If you bring them back into your relationship with your kids. Reaffirm these things in your relationship with your spouse. In every relationship that matters to make it a covenant relationship. If it's, if it's a relationship that matters, you make a covenant and bring the covenant power inside of that, inside of that relationship. I tell you, you make covenant and it'll bring covenant, the power of God into that relationship. I've actually made a covenant with you. I have a covenant with Discovery Church. I know there's going to be times where we misunderstand each other, where I misunderstand you or you misunderstand me. But in that moment, I'm not going to go, whatever, I'm out of here. I'm not because I made a covenant with you. I am unconditionally in this to the end with you. Can I get an amen? So let me show you. Here's the three things that we need to do. Number one, we will make the choice to love. I love teaching this. Uh, We will make the choice to love because I'm convinced that so many people think that love is a feeling. Love, Love is not a feeling. Now, love has feelings. Love does have feelings. But love is not a feeling. Love is a choice. It's a choice. Love is is when your kids are sick and you got to stay up late. And you got to hold the puke bowl and you have to put the cold rag on the head and make it cold again every 30, 45 minutes. And that's none of that feels good. But it's love. That that is love. Love holds the puke bowl. OK, that's what love does. Love empties that thing so it can be ready again when 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 it needs to be ready. That is love. OK, So, so what do we do? Make the choice. You make the choice all the time to love, even without the feelings, make the choice, choose love, just choose it. Just choose to love your choices will lead and your feelings will follow. Choose love, choose it. Colossians. That's why Colossians says three 14 and over all these virtues, he says, put on love. Notice he didn't say and have love. No, no, no. You got to put this thing. You got to choose it. You got to robe yourself with this. You got to wear it. Why? Because it binds all the other virtues, all the other values you want in your marriage. It binds them all together in unity. Love. Choose, choose love. We will make the choice to love. You bring that into that marriage. You make the choice. Make it a choice. Bring that into your kids. It probably is already there. Bring it into every relationship that matters. I promise is going to bring the power of God. Here's the second thing. And that is we will prioritize our relationship. We will prioritize our relationship. If we want to have this as long as we both shall live kind of marriage, then, then we just got to understand it takes maintenance. It's going to take some, some work to go into it. And you see, whatever I seek first, whatever I put my mind to first and my energy to first, there's a principle of the first things in the Bible. The first things, whatever you, wherever you put your first things gets God's blessing. Wherever, wherever you put the first things. And we need to put first things First, again, we need we need some of us need to reprioritize our life. And I'm not talking about just an ideology or philosophy, because a lot of you know what comes first. A lot of you know that God is first. A lot of you know that your marriage, that that relationship has a priority. So I'm not talking about ideology. I'm talking about, you know, actuality. Like we need to we actually need to put first things first in our lives. And the Bible says in Matthew six thirty three, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness And all these other things will be taken care of. Just put first things first. God is first. I'm going to seek God in this relationship, in this marriage. Galatians 6 says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. So if you don't like what you're getting, think about what you're giving. (laughs) For some of you in your marriage, you don't like what you're getting out of your marriage. Why don't you think about what you're sowing into it? All right. There's probably there, there's probably a correlation to that because some of you some of you may think, oh, my wife is just my wife is just not beautiful anymore. Well, could it be that you stop sowing beauty into her? Because your your spouse will become whatever you sow into them. 
You got to sow this thing, man. You got to sow it, sow it, sow into it. I got to make this a priority in our relationship. The next verse says, let us not become weary in doing good. Let's keep sowing. But you don't understand, Pastor. He's a snake. He's so mean. He's ugly. I get it. But keep sowing, keep sowing. Look, again, I'm, I'm not saying like in an abusive relationship and all that. So that's not what I'm saying. I don't say I'm not saying be a punching bag here. What I'm, I'm saying you need to keep investing into it, sowing, depositing into it let's not become weary in doing good for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we say it out loud if we do not give up don't give up church don't give up you'll reap a harvest keep sowing and then literally point number three i could i could i could end every message with this point right here um but listen to me church none of this is possible none of this that we're talking about these commitments that we make this love that we're to give this com- these It's just not possible outside of your relationship with Jesus Christ. It's just, it's just not possible. You cannot do anything. You don't have the power of yourself. The Bible says that we need to be tapping into the power of God to increase our capacity to love and change the world. So that's why number three, we will trust God. Like in, the, in every circumstance, in every, in every challenge, in every relationship, we will trust God. Because unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. Amen, everybody? Go ahead and put your heads down for just a moment, you guys. I want to pray for the marriages. I want to pray for, uh, if you're here today and you're with your spouse, can you just hold your spouse? Can you hold their hand? Can you just put your arm around them? Can you do something? like? I want to pray for you together. Um, in just a moment, I, I want to pray for those of you that are single today. I want to I want to speak blessing into your life. Some of you are here and your spouse isn't here. I want to pray for you as well. I want to pray for that relationship. Come on, just grab that hand. And we're, we've made a lot of commitments. Can we just declare it together that God, it, thank you for what you're doing in our marriage. A new thing you're doing. God, we, we commit as long as we both shall live to seek you, to seek God. You are, we're going to seek the one with my two. You will be the priority of our relationship. And I'm not going to expect from my spouse what can only come from you, God. You are my source. You are my purpose. You are my life. We're going to commit to seeking you, God. And we're going to commit to fight fair. We're, going to, we're not going to fight to win anymore. We're not going to fight for victory and fight for what we think is right anymore. We're going to fight for us. We're going to fight for our covenant We're going to fight to make it work. God, and we're committing to have fun. Breathe life back into our marriage, God. That we'd have fun again. Putting a log on the fire. God, we commit to staying pure. To monitor what is coming in. The pollution and the corruption. God, help us to maintain purity in our life. God, we commit to never give up. Never It's an unconditional commitment to an imperfect person. So God, help me. I need your power. I need your spirit. I need your strength. I can't do it without you. God, I pray for every single person that's here today. God, that you would help them live different in a world of compromise. That you would become their one. That they would seek the one while preparing for their two. God, help them that you would become the one of their life, that they would not live according to the culture in the dating game and and making themselves available like the world does. But God, that you would set them apart, consecrate their lives and their future marriages. God, help them, help them, help them, give them courage, give them strength. God, by the power of your spirit, I pray for every person that is here and not with their spouse, that God, you would bless them abundantly, that that spouse will be one by their quietness, by their submission, by the light that you've deposited with inside of them, by the salt that they are. Thank you, God, for bringing healing to relationships. If you're here today with every head bowed and eye closed, and maybe you don't know God as your personal Lord and Savior, that first point to seek God, you really, that has to be a personal thing before it can be a marriage thing. It doesn't work like that. You need to have a personal relationship with God. If you're here today and you're sensing just God... uh, pulling on your heart. I just want to let you know that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He's not going to force you into a relationship, but he is going to call you. He's going to call you. And right now you're sensing the call of God on your heart. He loves you. No matter what you've done, no matter how far you think you are, he loves you. 
And today I want to give you an opportunity to respond to the Holy Spirit's voice. He's already speaking to you. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. That's it. It's just, it's through faith, by grace. Like we don't deserve it. It's by grace. So if you're here today and you desire that, with every head bowed and eye closed, I'm not going to single you out. You're not, I'm not going to have you stand up or anything like that. Come to the front. I just want to pray with you this prayer of surrender, that you would make it a priority of your life, that you're going to seek God, that you're going to surrender it to him. Give him the control of your life today. Will you make up your mind right now? If that's you, you know God is speaking to you. Just begin to say, yes. Yes, Lord, I need you. I surrender my life to you. With every head bowed and eye closed, if that's you, lift up your hand. Don't be ashamed. Lift it high. Come on. Yes. I want to pray with you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Amen. Yes. Praise God. Praise God. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Go ahead and put them down. Pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Today, I surrender the control of my life to you. And I commit to seeking you and your kingdom and your righteousness first. I make you first in my life. I surrender it to you. Take over. Have control. Come make me brand new. Thank you, Jesus for forgiving me and for loving me unconditionally. Give me the capacity now to extend a love that is beyond me. Give me a capacity now to have covenant relationships that bring your power inside of them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Come on, give God some praise if you receive that today, church. Amen, amen.